Well, hello and welcome to this week's episode. I'm super psyched that you decided to spend some time with me today. I asked you to send in questions or um, things that your biggest challenges when it came to love and boundaries. And some of you, many of you are parenting teenagers. So therefore, that is going to be what I'm talking about in this episode is creating boundaries and positive discipline with teens because it can be incredibly challenging. And if you don't already know, for the ladies in the crew, Real Love Revolution season is upon us. So if you haven't already joined my free Facebook group with about 13,000 amazing souls in it, please do because the Wednesday Wisdom is going to be coming back, which means I'll be going live every Wednesday as of um, it's some date in December. I'll let you know. I think it's the beginning of December. Um, just taking your questions and talking about love, self-love, real love, passionate love. Real love revolution season is here and I'm super stoked. So let's move on. I want to start this episode with one of my favorite quotes from um, Khalil Gibran from the, the book, The Prophet, which was many decades old. And there's a very long quote that I love, but I'm only going to do the short version of it, which is to say, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. So I want you to let that sink in, right? Your children are not your children in the way of ownership. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. Right? We are compelled to perpetuate the species. Life itself, life force energy wants to create more life. That is true. But this is an incredibly important and wise way of looking at parenting. You have children not to fulfill your emotional needs, not to make your life easier, <laughs> not to be a narcissistic reflection of you, you have children, hopefully, because you want to raise good human beings who will do something good in the world. Or children can be an expression, right, of the, the love that you have with your partner. And we are compelled to procreate. This is real life. But I feel like there's a lot of different ways that people look at parenting and look at children. I do not like the whole mini-me thing. I don't like it. That soul is not a mini you. They're a completely separate human being. And I know maybe I'm getting a little picky in there, but think about it. I also don't, I, I don't like when t to kids saying, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. It's like, are you proud of you? I hope you are. I mean, I can be proud of you too, but I always want to instill in children that this self-determinedness. Um, I don't want them all being the people pleaser that I grew up being, right? Having the disease to please where it was all about, are you proud of me? Because that's what it's all about. Teaching children to be, become people that they are proud of, to do things that they are proud of. And listen, of course. This can only be at a certain phase of development where children can cognitively understand that. But we're constantly dropping the seeds of these experiences throughout raising children until they get to be teens. If you don't know anything about phases of development, the teenage years is a very, they are a very specific phase of development for teenagers. This is when they are separating and individuating from you. It's basically the second time they're doing it in the cycle because they also do it between two and three when they want you to do everything and then they want you to do nothing and they go between screaming that you have to do it and then crying that you, you're doing it like they can't decide what they want when they're, you know, that it's sort of like the re reproachment, they call it, phase of development when they're really young. This is different though because you can have a perfectly... Um, warm and fuzzy child suddenly kind of become a jerk, act like a jerk. Listen, they don't become jerks. It's a phase of development. It's not going to last. But the kid who used to want to cuddle is not going to want to. 
they can become sullen, they can become mouthy, right? They're always testing the boundaries. They think you know nothing. Don't worry, when they get to be in their 20s, they'll know how smart you are. But the real thing with parenting is that your job, your mandate, is to help them through this process. And you're really guiding them through this process. So if you are expecting a child to be a straight A student and never, never step outside of the box and never make any mistakes and never push any boundaries. And if you are controlling them to the degree that that is true, that really isn't healthy for them. But I don't want to get ahead of myself about what is and isn't good for them. Let's start with how can we decode this for you so you can understand what's happening for you while you're raising a teen. What is being um, activated for you from your life because that has everything to do with everything. And don't worry, I've created a surviving teens cheat sheet, a step-by-step -step guide that you'll be able to download. So don't worry. All right. Let me think my tea cup is big enough. Hi. Oh, those of you who are just listening can't see, but it's about the size of my head. Anyway, moving on to, let's start with your history. How was it for you growing up as a teen? Did your parents struggle? Did your, were your parents very authoritarian? Were your parents negligent? They weren't even there. They, they were on, they were like done parenting way before you were done being raised. Anybody? Anybody? Hands up. Okay. So, you know, so I'm going to give you a few questions that you can answer in our little cheat sheet which will give you some insights into what was your experience because what happens is that we'll have you will have anniversary dates we call them as you're raising teens as you're raising children in general but the teen years because they can be so problematic a lot of times will really kick up a lot of stuff for someone so in my own case when i inherited teens because that's how i raised children is that i actually married them it kicked up so much stuff for me in my own life about I was the last one uh, that my, my mother was raising basically my parents were already divorced and she was kind of just over it and so I thought about how you know there were times when you know it was like two o'clock in the morning on a I don't know Tuesday night perhaps and I was out drinking with tons of senior boys when I was a sophomore I mean nothing ever happened to me horrible but it could have and how, how are you going to bed when I'm not home at you know so there are things that I never would have thought of again in my life, most likely, had I not then um, found my family and been in a situation of helping co-parent teenagers with my husband, you know? So <clears throat> you'll have all of your own aha moments. And the reason why we want to go backwards, and I'll give you these blueprint questions, I call them, right? They're your own teen year blueprint questions is because if you don't um, bring them up into the light, the things that happened in your life that you didn't like or that hurt you, if you don't make a conscious choice to understand what happened then for you and to do something different, even though you swear you are not gonna do what your parents did, if you don't consciously choose a different action, I promise you, you will do what your parents did. So this is just how it is. It's like speaking another language. You have to really want to learn how to speak it. So once you go through and, and really sort of resurrect your own teen years for yourself through the questions and really start understanding why you are responding the way you may be to your teenager, because there is a, a reason that you are. It's not part of it is that it's painful. This kid you love so much, who you probably had a lot of harmony with, now you may not have harmony, or they're not interested in your opinion, or they don't want you to, they think you're corny. You know, when our kids were teens, they would be like, you guys are so bougie, calling each other babe. Like, you know, they, they would have their criticisms, and I would be like, yes, I don't even know what bougie is, but I am that, whatever that is, you know? Where I think that you have to, you can't want to be friends with your kids. You know, you can have a good relationship, but that's not the same as being friends. You're not friends. You will always be parents. You should always be parents. And I don't mean in telling them what to do. I just mean with appropriate boundaries. So you should not be partying with your teenagers ever. 
a graduation party, maybe, but not partying. You understand what I'm saying. Be the parent. That's what a kid needs. Even if they fight up, they, they push up against um, the rules and the regulations that you're trying to put into place. They know that you love them. So let's talk about structure. After you do the historical stuff, the, the download a blueprint, then we have to create a structure within the home. There has to be rules of engagement. We'll call them, you know, the, the family rules or whatever. You, with teenagers, they have to have structure because if you don't create it, then as their hormones are changing and as their moods are changing, girls are getting their period, their bodies are changing, boys are having testosterone pulsating through their system, making them want to do dangerous and stupid things and drive their car too fast and all of the many things that teenagers do. You just pray to God they survive it. But to make them safer, we create some kind of a container, some kind of a box. It doesn't have to be super strict, but make it a little bit smaller than it needs to be, knowing that they're going to step outside of that, right? Your job is to have everyone understands what the consequences will be for breaking the rules of the home. So it's a curfew, it's they have to do their chores, it's they have to get certain grades. Now, this is just my two cents. You know, you're gonna have people who are more modern or different than I am who think that the, what I'm saying is incorrect. I'm just telling you, you gotta do some kind of structure for kids because they need it. And if not, all of their instincts to be wild and run wild, there's nothing holding that back. So it isn't about squishing them or making them not be who they are. It's about keeping them safe with some kind of a container. And a container looks like structure and or rules. If you can, it's best to have a dinner at a particular time at night. If you can. For some families, you know, maybe it's impossible, but try. Like, don't, your kids are teenagers. They still really, really need you. They're not grown, no matter how grown they seem, they aren't. They need the compassion. And even though they look like adults, you have to remember that they're not. So the structure can be, you know, what are the agreements? Keep the common parts of the house, areas of the house clean. Um, they have to do certain chores. They have to keep certain grades. They have to be home at a certain time. You know, no, I don't know going out on a school night past a certain time, whatever those things are. And you're always having to sort of negotiate and barter with teenagers. You have to think about what do they care about? Because only by sort of threatening to take away what they care about, if they're breaking rules, will they comply, right? Because this is most of the time, if kids are acting out, the it's, there's nothing that's going to make them stop unless they feel the loss of that thing, whether it's they can't use the car this weekend or, you know, you, you know from where you live, your home, what, what appropriate um, punishment is. Um, I do strongly suggest family therapy when you're starting to have kid, uh, teens because it's incredibly helpful. It was for my family where someone who helped me figure out what that container, what Vic and I, to figure out what that container should look like. Right, because we really didn't know. We both grew up not with that kind of structure. Would have been really helpful had I had it, but I didn't. So I wanted to, to some degree, create that for the best, the best that I could with the kids, even though I came in kind of late, you know. So you figure out the structure and an agreement, like okay. So and so now we agree. If you're late for for curfew, then these this is the consequence. And part of the reason why you need to stick to the consequences is because if you don't, you're A, not teaching them anything. You're teaching them they can get away with things and that you're too tired to enforce the consequence. Um, when our youngest son was in trouble, acting out like crazy, hanging out with a bad crowd, I remember um, you know, we, he switched schools. There was a whole bunch of things that were going on, but he was definitely in trouble without a doubt. We looked into like military school. There were all of these things. And we just grounded him for like three months. We just were like, and because of this terrible thing that happened, that was very dangerous for you, now you can't go out. And what ended up happening was, as much as Vic and I knew this meant that we were grounded for three months, what it really did for our youngest was it gave him the attention and the time with us that he needed and that he craved. 
And so as much as he was being punished, we weren't mad at him the whole time, right? You, you, we just were all home together while the two older boys were out living their lives, doing their thing. It was me, Vic, and our youngest spending all of this time. And apparently that's what he needed. So as much as, you know, when you punish kids, you realize you have, they're grounded. You need to stay home with them. Like you're, they're grounded. And now it's more family time, basically. So it doesn't have to always be so painful. It was just that he was in trouble. And so that was what we came up with. And that was the, the end result. And he really did straighten out after that three month period, switched him back to his old school. Like, you know, there were other changes that we made, but there was a clarity that we all came to that he was hanging out with kids that were really not in his, for his best interest. And he was too, he was emotionally immature and too immature to see that these kids were really into bad things. Like not just like regular bad things, but really bad things. Anyway, I share that little uh, anecdote because it's basically, you'll figure out what's right for your family. I would never say that's right for anyone else because I don't know if it is. I just know that that's what we needed to do to keep him safe. And so that's what we did. So you'll figure out the rules, the structure, and the consequences, because it's really important. The next thing is to really grasp that it's not personal. And this really requires you to get out of your ego and realize this is not about you. It is about the kid and your job is to ferret them, to guide them, to lead them through this transition of their growing up. So expect that something will change for them. It's, it really has to be all about them. When you raise kids, you know that this was what you signed on for, right? I remember saying to my mother at one point when th there was a lot of trouble with, within the kids when Vic and I were first together and kids were acting out. And I remember one, I don't know, six months in, even though I was always just, I, mean, I was never like going to leave, but I was just like, wow, this is harder than I thought. And I remember talking to my mother and I said, um, you know, this is totally not what I signed on for. <laughs> and she was like, uh, you know what? This is exactly what you signed on for. Hello? You married a guy with teenage sons, three of them. She was like, your job, it is now your mandate to do the best that you can with the time that you have with them. Teach them, parent, be present. Yeah, it's painful. Nobody made you do it, but you're, you're already doing it. So get it together. Anyway, she was always great to really like give me that wake up call advice because the truth is with raising teenagers and raising children, nobody ever said it was going to be easy, right? Nobody said it was going to be without its challenges, but you can handle them. And when you really think about what you're doing as a parent, it, your job is to do everything that you can so that your children become the best citizens of the world that they possibly can, that they become the best human beings that they possibly can, right? Isn't, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Raising decent human beings, yes. And so that happens through how, you know, positive discipline, conversation, dialogue. You have to be talking even when they don't want to talk, even when they act snotty, even when they go, I'm not telling you, you can say, okay, well, if you change your mind, uh, I'll be here. And I'm not saying, let's clarify, I'm not saying put up with shit because they're, these are two different concepts. You being super reactionary to a teen is you being in your ego, okay? You have to be the parent all the time and every time. It doesn't mean you won't fail. Of course we fail. I failed a million times, you know, in the, the years that I was there. It's like, this is being a human being, right? We're going to fail. But you have to remember that you are always the parent. So that means really not fighting with a teenager like your siblings or your friends because you're not. Your job is to control those things in the way of not tolerating. If there's disrespect, you say, listen, no, that doesn't work for me. The thing is though, you must treat your teenagers with respect because if you treat them disrespectfully and then expected them 
to treat you respectfully, you're on drugs because it, it is not do what I say and not what I do because that shit does not work. If you treat your children with respect at any age, do not scream in anyone's face. Do never call names. Never go for the juggler with your teen. I don't care what has happened in your life. Whatever you need to do to get your shit together enough so that you are never doing that to children, like going for the juggler, right? right? Like saying the meanest thing. Because, wow, you are the, you're the last person on earth who should do that because you are the first person on earth who could do the most damage to that person, that child, that teenager's self-esteem by doing that. Yes, it's frustrating. Yes, it's hard. Right. That's called being a parent. So we're taking a deep breath. We're talking, not taking it personally, though, and stepping back, expecting that there's going to be some acting out. That is a good place to start. Don't be shocked. Millions of teenagers have, who looked like they would become criminals turned into perfectly respectable adults. So it also won't last forever. That's another point that I wanted to make. When you're in it, it feels like it has lasted forever, but it isn't going to be. And this is also a phase of development. Do as much, as much research as you can on parenting. It is actually something that it should come with a book or some way of you knowing how to do it, but it doesn't. So learn because there's so much stuff out there that's free, just like this podcast, this video. Do your own due diligence. It's not about blaming the kid. When people say, oh, well, I was just talking to someone the other day who said, well, you know, the the parents were like yelling at the kids because, you know, the, the kids are, they're spoiled. I mean, they are. I was like, right. And who spoiled them? Did they fall off? They came out of the womb spoiled? I don't think they did. Do not blame a kid for bad behavior when you're not disciplining them in a positive, productive, and consistent way. How will they know? So if you're being run by your five-year-old, you need to figure out positive discipline. There's a million and five books out there. Get them, you know? But there's also a transference that can happen. And part of the the questions that I'm providing in your little uh, surviving teens cheat sheet um, will let you get some insight into who who this this, uh, teenager might be kicking up feelings for you. And you might be having some kind of a transfer, in fact, relating to the teen as if they are the other person. There might be some other bully in your life, a boundary bully from when you were younger. And so you feel less capable of handling the teenager because of their rage if it kicks up fear from the past for you. So anyway, the questions will be in there. You'll get some insight, and I think that that will be helpful. Um, You can be firm but loving. There is a way to be firm but loving. Even when the kid isn't acting loving, you always love them. And so it can't be that you're so thin-skinned during this time. It really has to be that you do your best to, you just have to let some things go. It can't be everything and you can't let everything go. So I'm talking to both sides of the parent spectrum right now. Some of you just can't even deal and you're like, you're already grown if they're 16, do your thing. No. And some of you are like trying to still control that 16 year old like they were a four year old and that's a no as well. You know, but you don't want to let a kid act out physically, physical violence, those types of things, then you have to get into therapy if that is happening because they're definitely acting out veiled feelings of the family system. Like something is happening unless they have some other kind of a diagnosis. But it's very hard to tell with teenagers because they go through this period. So it's very hard to know. I mean, unless some, a child is, a teen is acting actually psychotic, you know, it, it's young to decide if somebody has a personality disorder. It's this, these are phases of development that bring certain types of behavior. You know, think about your own teen years. I think about mine and I'm just grateful I'm alive. Um, all right. And then the last point I wanted to make is, wow, this got so much longer than I wanted it to, or I thought it was going to, is that your job, you have to take the high road. You just have to. Every time and all the time. I'm not saying you never lose your temper with, with, with a teenager, especially if they're being mouthy, but appropriately, this is unacceptable. No, and now you're not going out. Give me the keys, take the keys, go to your room. Whatever it is that you're, like, you can be firm, but you can't let them 
goat you or goad you, is what I mean, like bait you, into having some kind of a horrible interaction. It's your job is to protect both of you from that experience and get into the world of teens. If you're raising a teenager, know what they're doing. Be on their social media. You need to care. Do not let kids who are underage be on social media without, without your supervision. And my thing is, don't let them be on social media at all if you can stop them. Like maybe Instagram, maybe. If it's a closed account, that you monitor. But there's lots of ways to know what a kid is doing. And I do believe that a teenager has a right to a certain level of psychological and emotional privacy. But I also believe that until they are actually grown, while they are still minors, you really are responsible for what happens to them. And there are a lot of bad elements out there. And so even with what they're watching, what they're consuming and Netflixing, and it matters. And I know it might be overwhelming, but there's got to be some rules around tech. There's got to be some during the week, because of school, whatever it's going to be. It's just, it just can't be 24 seven on devices. And if that is what's happening, you're really, really doing your teenager a disservice. And you think that they won't handle it if you make rules, but the truth is they will. The new normal sits in like it, they, they get used to it so much faster than you would ever think they could. So I know that was a ton. I'm sorry it was so long. <laughs> I hope that it was helpful for those of you who wrote in and asked me to do this. Here it is. This is for you. And, you know, listen, these boundaries, love, self-love. This is connected to self-love in the way that the more efficiently and effectively you parent, the better you feel about it, the happier you feel about yourself, the more empowered you are. The more out of control you feel, the more fearful you're going to be. And listen, parenting, teens, is fear-inducing. I don't care how good you are at it. So I'm not saying you're not going to feel any anxiety. You will. But there's a way to do it where you can lessen so much of the anxiety, and that's what that surviving teens cheat sheet is all about so don't forget to download it and keep your eyes and ears open for our um wednesday wisdoms that are going to be starting in december so i hope you guys uh, enjoyed this if you did please share it on your social media platforms i hope you have an amazing week and as always take care of you <music>